Take your Bible, turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 30, 1 Samuel chapter 30. Title of the message is David encouraged himself in the Lord. David encouraged himself in the Lord. 1 Samuel chapter 30. While you're turning there, heard about a story. A man went to visit a saint asylum. And while he was there, he saw over 100 people standing around and only three guards to uh, control that big crowd. And, and the guy said to one of the guards, he says, how in the world can you keep track of all these people? And he says, well, you, you got to understand something. Uh, lunatics never join together, only locusts do. <laughs> well, there's a lot of truth to that now, isn't it? You know, you got to have unity. you got to have unity. Here in 1 Samuel chapter 30, notice verse 1 with me. It says, and it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag, on the third day that the Malachites had invaded the south and Ziklag and smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire and had taken the women captive and that were therein, they slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. So David and his men came uh, to the city and behold, it was burned with fire and their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voices and wept until they had no power to weep. And David's two wives were taken captives, uh, Hanon and the Jezreelite, and Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. But notice what David did. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. Amen. Sometimes you may feel like you're going through extreme discouragement and things are happening all around you, but we can learn some truths this morning about how we can encourage ourselves in the Lord because our God is good, isn't he? Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that your Holy Spirit will meet with us. Speak to our hearts. I pray that you encourage every person here today. Help us to learn some truths that will keep us close to you. Help our eyes to stay focused on Jesus Christ and follow you and not, no, not another man. These folks don't need to follow me. They need to follow Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord, as we all follow you together. We'll see great and mighty things done. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, there's a lot of battles that we all face in life, and sometimes these battles are, are yeah, fairly simple. And as we grow older, some battles become easier. But there's some battles that we, can, we fight that just level us to the ground. There's physical battles, whether it be age, physical limitations, or health. People battle battles with heart disease or cancer or MS, uh, poor health. Uh, there's all kinds of emotional battles that people may f uh, fight, whether it could be a battle of bitterness uh, with, with somebody. Or some people never get over when something bad happens to them, whether it be in their childhood or part of their life, something bad happens, and they never get over it, and that defines the rest of their life. And that's a sad case for, for anybody to let that happen. And let me say this, it doesn't have to be that way. All right, But there's mental battles, battles with discouragement. Uh, depression. Think about people who have strokes and how the stroke limits their abilities. It may bring confusion. It may limit their speech or their ability to walk or function like they used to. There's battles that we may fight or face with families, family members, or friends, or battles at work. But there's all kinds of battles that people face. We face them all the time. It's part of our life. In this passage, we see a great man, a man of battle, that was King David, or David, he wasn't king at the time. Think of all the things that David saw. He saw death. He had people turn against him. He faces different battles. Uh, uh, here's another battle he's facing that leveled him to the ground. If you think about what he was going through at this time in history of his life, King Saul uh, was jealous of David. If you remember when he killed Goliath, uh, the people, the women, were singing a song that really irritated uh, King Saul. Uh, they sang, Dave, uh, Saul has killed his thousands, but David had killed his ten thousand. And Saul, King Saul acted like a little child. He says, did you hear what they said? David's killed, I've killed my thousands, but David killed his ten thousand. He was, he was like a little kid, selfish and jealous over that. And, uh, but it got to him, it got to the point that any time he looked at David, all he did was find fault in his life. And David never did anything wrong. God had set him to be the leader, and people were, uh, Saul was angry at that. So David was going to be the next king over Israel, and anything David did, Saul found fault in it. He got to the point that he threw a javelin at him a couple different times. 
He got to the point where he would chase him and try to, to kill him himself. So David went through all of these situations. There's one situation where uh, King Saul was up in a hill country and he, at, at the top of the hill, there was a little low spot. And so that's where he bedded down at. And he was surrounded by 3,000 of his, his army men. And for anyone to go in there to try to harm him would have been insane. It would have been a suicide mission. But David was so hurt. He was so tired to be uh, hunted down and attacked by the king that he was so faithful to. He never did anything wrong. He, uh, he loved King Saul. He knew, he, he understood too why, why there was problems. But he th that said to himself, I'm going to do something. Who will go down with me to the king? And there's one guy that uh, said he would go down with him. Uh, he was a, um, a brother to Joab, the little brother. I think his name was Athahel. And he said he'd go down there. So David and his brother went down there at night. They snuck down into the camp. And as the Bible says, God put a deep sleep on King Saul and them. And they took his uh, water drinking jug and they took some things for him. And if you want to turn back to 1 Samuel chapter 26, just a couple of pages over, look at verse 15, what David did. Now remember, he's tired of running for his life. He's tired of Saul uh, uh, attacking him. And Abner here is the captain of, of the host there. He's responsible for the safety of the king. And David said unto Abner, verse 15, Art not thou a valiant man? And who is like to thee in Israel? Wherefore, because of this, then hast thou not kept thy lord the king? For they came out one of the people in to destroy the king thy lord. This thing is not good that thou hast done. As the Lord liveth, ye are worthy to die, because ye have not kept your master, the Lord's anointed. And now see where the king's spear is and the cruise of water that uh, was uh, at his bolster. So David, and uh, he stood up there on one side of the hill facing the army where there was a great gap in between. And he stood up and he started shouting at the top of his lungs. And he knew he was talking to Abner. He says, you're worthy to die. You did not, you, you did not fulfill your do duty in protecting the king. He says, where's his spear? Where's his cruise of water? And David's holding them right here for all to see. Oh boy, was he scared for his life. Now, as David is speaking, Saul heard David's voice and he realized what had happened. He knew that his life had been spared again. Saul broke down and confessed that he had sinned and called for David to return. He asked him to come back and he promised, I'll never try to hurt you again. But David's been through that scenario before. And David, uh, David returned the spear and the cruz to Saul, but he went another way. He understood this guy is never going to leave me alone. He was so hurt, he was so discouraged, so downhearted that he and his small band of misfits, and see, people joined him because he was a great man, he was a great leader, and the, the people that followed him were uh, castaways. Nobody wanted them. But he took these misfits and he did great things with them. He was just a good man. He took his misfits with him and left, and he went over to the land of the Philistines to live there. He says, he's not going to follow me over there. And that's exactly what happened when Saul realized that David was over in the land of the Philistines. He left him alone. But one of the kings there, the king of Achish, uh, he gave David a small town in the country called Ziklag. And so that's where David and his men stayed for one year and four months. Now, that was a wise move on David's part. While he was there, he separated. He's outside of the city where the king can't see him. And he would disappear for a while and he and his men would go and fight against the enemies of Israel and destroy them. And as you read the story, it's a fascinating story. As you read the story, he would destroy man, woman, and child. He would not leave any witnesses alive when he went in there. Now he's destroying Israel's enemy. And when King Achish would come and talk to him, he said, hey, where you been today? I heard you were gone. Yeah, we went to the south of Judah. We went here. So Achish is believing that David is fighting against his own people. And this is bringing Achish closer to him. He says, now he's going to serve me the rest of the days of his life. Look at chapter 27, verse 8. It says, and David and his men went up and invaded the Ger uh, Gershites and the Ge Gezerites. And the Amalekites, those are enemies of Israel, for those nations were of old, the inhabitants of the land, as thou goest to Shur, even to the land of Egypt. And David smote the land and, and left neither man nor woman alive and took away the sheep and the oxen and the asses, the camels and the apparel and returned and came to Achish. 
And Achish said, Whither have ye made a road to today? And David said, Against the south of Judah and against the south of Jer uh, Jeremites and against uh, the south of the Kenites. And David saved neither man nor child, woman alive, to bring tidings to Gath. That's where Achish was, saying, Lest they should tell on us, saying, So did David, and so will be the manner of all uh, while he dwelt in the country of the Philistines. And Achish believed David, saying, He hath made his people Israel to utterly uh, to abhor him. Therefore, he shall be my servant forever. So we see that. In chapter 28, you see how God protected David from having any part of the battle that was going to be fought against Israel. The Philistines are now preparing to go against Israel to fight them. And so David is a mighty man of valor. He's, a, he's very smart and cunning and witting and powerful in battle. And he can rally the troops. They follow him and uh, they, they destroy the enemies. And so David knows this stuff. He knows what he's doing. And so, um, um, so Achish, uh, he, he calls for uh, David to come and fight with him. He wants him to come and fight with him. And so uh, David goes over there with him. And instead of that happening, the rest of the Philistines said, no, no, he may turn on us. And when they took the vote, it was like, Four to one, ten to one, whatever it was. And so uh, while David was away from Ziklag, here he is, he's with them, and th th so they reject him, they turn him back. So uh, he turns him back to go back to Ziklag. Now while they're gone, something terrible happens. The Amalekites came in. They took his wife, all of their wives, they took all of their children, and the Bible says they didn't kill any of them. Now, that's a miracle in itself. They just took them all away from them. They took all of their stuff. When David and his men get back, he'd already been leveled to the ground. Here's a year and a half later, almost a year and a half later. He's starting to feel more stable emotionally. He's getting back on his feet. He's doing some great and powerful things. And now he's leveled to the ground again. They get back and everything's burned to the ground. I want you to think of what he's been through. He's rejected by his own king and his own homeland. He's rejected by the land that he's now living in. No, we don't want you to go to battle with us. They were not trusted, trusted by anyone on both sides of the fence. Their homes had been burned to the ground. Their wives and their children were taken as slaves. Now, even his faithful men they're ready to stone him. Why did you leave us this way? We have nothing left because of you. You've destroyed our lives. Now we have nothing left. What else could go wrong? David was in a very, very bad situation. We can think of how the people felt, but can you imagine how David felt? The depression he was going through. Now, what you and I have to remember is, in David's situation, even in your situation, in my situation, God's in complete control. God knows what he's doing. I want you to think about what God was doing. On David's side, all he sees is loss. That's it. But on God's side, God protected David from being in the battle that killed King Saul, Jonathan, and Saul's other son. If David were in that battle, he probably couldn't live with himself. As you know the story, David and Jonathan, their hearts were knit together as brothers. They weren't brothers, but they were as brothers. The close friendship and the bond that they had was inseparable. David uh, would have been associated with that and accused of as a traitor. And God says, I'm not going to let that happen. God did not want David to even be there to turn against the Philistines to protect Saul. God would not put him in that situation. Because as you see, read the story, God was going to kill Saul that day. He was just a wicked, did some terrible things, and God says, this is it, your time's up. God also, during that time, preoccupied David with the Amalekites and was also preparing David to return home. That's why God allowed the homes to be burned to the ground. Because after this, David returned back to Israel. Notice in chapter 30, verse 3. 
Verse 3 says, So David and all his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire. Their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. Then David and, his, and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no power to weep. Stop there for a second. I'm sure many of you have been there before. You've been to that place where you cried and cried and cried, and you have no more power to cry. Maybe it's the loss of a spouse or a loved one. Maybe the situations you've been through in life. You live long enough, you go through some of those. You just can't help it. But you cry yourself to the point where there's no power. Even big men cry from time to time. We all go through this. Verse 5 says, And David's two wives were taken captive. Abin, uh, uh, Noam, the Jezreelite, and Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite. And David was greatly distressed. Have you ever been there? He was greatly distressed. And then it says, For the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people were grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. Think about that. David could take a lot. He's the leader. But now when his own men, when they fought together, they bled together, some of them died in his arms. But here's his people, his most faithful men. They turn on him and speaking of stoning him and casting him out. He couldn't take any more. What more could he take? How much more could he handle? But then it says, and this is what we need to learn from, but David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. As a child of God, we have something the world does not have. The world can go through some extreme measures, extreme circumstances, which is part of life. A lot of them just don't know how to handle it. I don't know how to handle it apart from God. But when you and I go through it, we have so many promises. We know that what we go through is a part of God's plan and purpose. Romans 8, 28, for all things work together for good to them that love God who are called according to His purpose. We don't understand the purpose, but God does. But we know that we can trust in Him. We can depend in Him. Lord, I don't see it. I don't see where You're taking us with this. I don't see the end of this situation. But I've learned this. I can trust You. And here's David. He understands that. And he's come to a place in his life where he says, that he encouraged himself in the Lord his God. And that's something you can, I can do. How do we encourage ourselves in the Lord our God? The first thing that we see David did, he recognized that he had been attacked by an enemy. You and I have an enemy. The enemy it may not be what you think it is, because the Bible tells us in Ephesians, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against spiritual wickedness on high places. There's a battle that's taken place where people become susceptible to be, allow themselves to be a tool of the devil rather than a tool of God. We all have choices to make. You can take the, the high road, be strong and follow God, or you take the weak road and go down and be a tool of the devil. It's your choice. Are you going to be, be for the good or for the bad? Well, we want to choose the good. We want to take the hard path, but the path where he carries us where God carries us through it. He walks through it. He puts his arm around us. He carries us. David knew who his enemy was. It wasn't his men that were talking of stoning him. That They were not his enemy. The enemy were the Amalekites. They're the one that took the wives and their children and the wives of the men and the children. And we need to realize who our enemy is, and our enemy is out to destroy us. He want, he's bent on that. He wants to run you down. He wants to discourage you. He wants to level you. The Amalekites, they attacked David through his family. There's a lot of things a man can take. You can handle a lot of things in your life. You don't mind another man standing up and bumping chests against you because you can put that man down real fast. You can handle that situation. But when somebody attacks your children and you're not there to protect them, that hurts. Amen. That's hard. When they, they, they just remove them from you. It's like out in the world, there's a world out there that hates Christians. 
And when you as a Christian mom and dad, you've got your children, and then the world wants to turn them away from God, which turns them away from you, now your kids are saying stuff, they're rebelling against you, they're yelling at you, where did this child come from? That's not normal. That eats you up, that tears you up. You realize an enemy has done this to me and my family. There's an enemy. The Amalekites attacked David by attacking his family and the families of the men. The Amalekites were a people that Saul was told to destroy at the beginning of his reigns, his reign. God told him, you go into the Amalekites, destroy every man, woman, and child, and the beast, kill them all. But he didn't do it. The prophet comes in and says, then what meaneth this bleeding of the sheep? And there's the king. How come you've not done that? See, because of Saul's disobedience earlier on, now David has to fight it. David has another problem. He's got to deal with the situation, and he does. He does what the former king did not do. So when others fail to do their job, that means it affects someone else. What else did David do to encourage himself? One, number one, we see that he realized who the real enemy was. It wasn't his men, it was the Amalekites. Number two, David went to the priest and asked for the ephod. Now the ephod, look at chapter three, verse seven. It says, and David said unto Abathar the priest, Amalek's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. And Abathar brought thither the ephod of David. Now what an ephod is, a priest and the kings, they're the only two people that wore an ephod. Ephod was like an undergarment of linen of some sort. So upon that garment for the priest, it held all the other priestly uh, articles. They put everything upon that. This is his undergarment. So we see his breastplate of righteousness was on that. It was wrapped with the girdle and uh, the, the belt, whatever. Everything was attached to that. David is the king, the same thing. It's the undergarment. It's the one that... You, you, uh, they wear, uh, you know, um, here he is. He wears it as he approaches God. He doesn't approach God with all of his kingly armor on. He approaches God as naked. And now he wasn't naked, understand that. As naked and here I am before you without any defense. I stand before you defenseless. You are my God. And so he's wearing the ephod as he prays to God. He wants to know something for God. And you know what? You see, look at verse 8. He says, and David inquired of the Lord saying, shall I pursue after this troop? So he's wearing, standing before the, the, the God in his ephod, naked and open. Lord, here I am. I am nothing before you. I am just, uh, I stand before you as nothing. Lord, shall we pursue them? I'm seeking wisdom from you. If you look back what Saul went to, he went to the witch of Endor tried to drumming up the prophet Samuel who had passed away. David doesn't do that. He stands before God with nothing to offer God. God, what do you want me to do? Shall I pursue them? And notice what he says here. Shall I overtake him? And he answered him, God answered him, pursue. For thou shalt surely overtake them and without failure recover all. When you're going through a hard time in your life, you go before God as nothing. You go before God with nothing to offer, empty, full humility, and say, God, I am broken. I have nothing. I am nothing. What would you have me to do, Lord? What do you want me to do in this situation? I'm at a loss. I bring it to you and ask you. And we see that God tells him, you're going to recover all without fail. God answered him. God accepted him in that state of humility. In a state of humility, it says, go. Go get them. Hold up the torch. Go get them and destroy them. So we need to inquire of the Lord. We need to take everything to God, and God will uh, answer you. So that's the second thing you do. Let me uh, go on and give you the last one. I'm going to skip it uh, because of... Uh, let me share this verse with you before we uh, quit here. Ephesians, go over to Ephesians chapter 3. Keep your finger here in Samuel. Go to Ch Ephesians chapter 3. I want you to notice what Paul said here. And, and maybe this will be sweet to your soul later on. Um, uh, the verses here, you can read it later on too and find comfort in it. In Ephesians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 
In Ephesians chapter 3, look down at verse 14. A lot of the battles you and I fight are much, much bigger than we are, and we need help. But Paul says in verse 14, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom, now notice this, the whole family in heaven and in earth. These are people who already died in Christ, and those who are still alive on earth. Of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. There's the secret for folks. That's why we go before him. So God can strengthen you and me with his might in our inner person. A lot of Christians, you may not be strong on the outside, but you can be strong on the inside. Strong in your faith in Jesus Christ. And he says, uh, verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge, that he might be filled with all the fullness of God. And that's what God wants you to be. Now notice verse 20, now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power of that worketh in who? Wow. The power that worketh within us. The power of Christ in us. To be strengthened with his might in our inner man. That's where you get your strength, folks. That's how we endure the impossible situations. That's how we handle things in great discouraging times. To be strengthened with his spirit, his might in the inner man because the power of Christ that worketh in us. Let me give you the last thing he did. Number three, he got back into the battle. Go back to 1 Samuel chapter 30, 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 9. He got back into the battle. You fall off a horse, you get back on. And same thing with a motorcycle. You fall off your motorcycle, you get back on, all right? And so here he says in 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 9. So David went, he and his 600 men, that were with him and came to the brook of Besor where those that were left behind stayed. So he went. Whenever you go through great discouragement, you need to do like David did. Number one, we read, he realized who the enemy is. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual wickedness and high places. Number two, you remember who you are in Christ. I am a child of God. I need to be strengthened with his might. I need to come before him naked and open with nothing to offer him. And I'm strengthened with his might, with his spirit within me and my inner man so that his power works in and through us, his power. So we remember who you are in Jesus Christ. And then the last thing, you get back into the battle. Get back into the fight. See, we need to know what the battle is about. The battle is not uh, uh, against people. The battle is a spiritual battle that we fight. And the way you and I get back into the battle is we get on our knees. God, I need you. I need your strength. I need your wisdom. I need your righteousness on my life. I need to do your will and not my will. You get back in the battle on your knees and ask God for his power in your life. Another way to get back in the battle, you tell people about Jesus Christ. That's what makes Satan angry. He wants people to go to hell. He doesn't want them to know the truth. And he will fight, he will claw, and he will do anything and everything he can do to stop you and me from witnessing to people about Jesus Christ. Because the Bible says it's the word of God that's rich and powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. It reaches to the intentions of the heart. It can do what nothing else can do. It converts sinners to saints. It brings people to Jesus Christ. That's what the Word of God does, and Satan wants to stop it. That's his mission in life, and our purpose is to get it out there and tell people about Christ. Right. We tell them about Christ. You see people about, get saved, and eventually you're going to become so strong that those things don't affect you anymore. Amen. You see it. You know it. But here's the thing. People who don't do those things People, they're going to get discouraged more easier. And as the Satan attacks them, he, some will fall off to the side. Some will become fearful and afraid and flee. And some will just never really get back into the battle 
and not doing anything. But the mighty men, the strong men and women of Jesus Christ, those who are strengthened with his power and his might in the inner man, as they fight, they're going to experience some great things for Jesus Christ. Let me share another verse. I'll close on this one. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. One of my favorite verses, mark it down. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not faint. Amen. You and I, we can run and not be weary. And we can walk and not faint. Let's get back into the battle. Let's pray.